mask, please, uh, during the panel. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really excited to have this conversation, especially in this room, which I think is really appropriate given the sort of incredible ceiling that we're all witnessing. Um, and so for today's panel, we have artists, architects, journalists, and editors, all of whom have worked directly with publications to make art, write stories, and to provide artists with a space to voice their distinctive viewpoints on world events and urgent issues. Throughout the hour, we're going to present our work in the field, and then we will transition into a conversation that focuses on how to expand this kind of work with each of the participants weighing in on their own stories of successes and failures of working in this manner. We hope to cover how we can lift this work out of the kind of niche that it's in right now and share tangible ways that publications can make room for this kind of work. So first, I want to introduce Surya Matu. He is an artist, investigative data journalist, and the senior data engineer at The Markup. He previously worked at ProPublica and Gizmodo's special project desk, and he was the inaugural iBeam Journalism Fellow in 2017. Ivan Siegel is the executive director of Global Voices and a researcher and artist. He's been a fellow at the Library of Congress and the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. He works on long-term explorations of societies, undergoing conflict and political change, and collaborative projects with communities to portray their own experiences and control their own media systems. Allison Killing is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and licensed architect who uses satellite imagery and data visualization to investigate urgent social issues. Robin Kwong is the new formats editor at the Wall Street Journal and co-founder of the Contemporary Narratives Lab. He also created the Uber game, a popular news game where you play as a full-time Uber driver trying to make ends meet when he was at the Financial Times. As for me, I'm a journalist. For two decades, I have written about art and politics with a focus primarily on the Middle East. I launched two artist-led journalism platforms for two New York nonprofit organizations called Creative Time and iBeam, which I will discuss shortly. All right, 
I'm going to kick it off with my presentation. So, collaboration, not instrumental, not instrumentalization. How newsrooms can work with artists to produce compelling journalism. I know that's a really big mouthful, but I think it kind of gets to the heart of what we're going to try to talk about today. So, first, I wanted to say that I think everybody on this panel today would probably agree that there is an impulse for many publications to see art as a way to sort of illustrate or decorate a story. But I think that approach really misses the potential power it can have for certain publications. So I believe that art explores abstract truths, and when it's paired with rigorous journalism, readers are able to understand a story in a way that is closer to how they experience the world itself. In other words, art can bypass analytical interpretation by engaging an audience's senses. I'm gonna do a very quick sort of history of art and how we got here. So I come a little bit from a fine arts perspective, um, meaning the organizations I worked for were really steeped in working with um, visual artists and social, social justice activist artists. So this one is a really important piece for us to think about because it's sort of, it's spiral jetty, it's made by the artist Robert Smithson who was incredibly famous and the idea was that in the late 1960s, art started to move outside of a white box construct and into a more explicit conversation with the environment it engaged with. And this piece in particular is really a good example of that. It's about the idea of entropy, growth, and the circular nature of time. Here, the environment, okay, either social or cult cultural, becomes the subject of the work. Now this is the organization that I first started working with, which is Creative Time, which is a nonprofit public art organization in New York that does a lot of work that's solely in the public sphere. And this piece was done in 1989, right? And it's called Kissing Doesn't Kill, Greed and Indifference Do. And so it's from an artist collective called Grand Fury. And the idea was that this was the height of the AIDS crisis in the United States. And this was a political art action that was appropriating advertising and media strategies to spread information about AIDS and its social ramifications to a vast audience. So this idea was that pairing of this piece's message with three couples kissing. And it appeared on postcards and on buses all throughout New York and in San Francisco. Creative Time's probably most iconic piece is something you've all seen, which is the Tribute in Light, two beams of light that come out of the World Trade Center, was made six months after 9-11, and it was coordinated with two artists in particular, as well as the city, and as you know, it continues to become a year, yearly exhibition that's happening. But you sort of see the trend that I'm talking about here, right? Then that all kind of leads to this idea of if we are making, if we have all of these artists who are working and thinking about social issues, what does it mean to actually take their voices and put them into a space where they can speak to broad publics, right? So that meant for the organization moving ideas online. And so you had this really like growing crop of artists who were themselves calling themselves like social practice artists. Their practice focused on social issues. So how do we take their issues and bring them into the world of journalism? So we created this website called Creative Time Reports. And the idea of this was basically to have commissioning, commission artists create works that either were partnered with major uh, news organizations like The Guardian, the New Yorker, Slate, Salon, Al Jazeera America. This was one of our very biggest pieces that we did with the artist Trevor Paglin. It was launched the day that The Intercept launched. Trevor Paglin is a photographer, and he did a project where we flew over the NSA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and he took photos of each of these agencies, and he made them available in the public realm. And the idea about this was, you know, this was post the Snowden Trove archive, and he was compelled to create a kind of image that would be 
part of the visual lexicon of this story. It would be something that could be a kind of reference point for a larger conversation, for something that was very complicated and hard to understand. He wanted to create the images that could connect to the stories that we were reading. Other pieces that we did at the time were one was with Ai Weiwei, where he talked about, um, you know, about, about China, in particular about the media. And I went to and actually met him in Beijing at the time. And one of the quotes from his story that he wrote, which we co-published with The Guardian, was society allows artists to explore what we don't know in ways that are distinct from the approaches of science, religion, and philosophy. As a result, art bears unique responsibility in the search for truth. Another piece we did was with Molly Crabapple who was an artist who had visited uh, Guantanamo and had done a lot of portraits of detainees in Guantanamo. And this was one that we collaborated with the Daily Beast. So as you see, what we did is we would commission a lot of these artists and then we would co-publish a lot of these pieces with very large um, publications. And the idea being, how do we get more of their work out to large audiences? Then, in around 2018, we launched, I launched with iBeam, the Center for the Future of Journalism, which took on a bit of a different model. It acted in many ways, and we like to think of it um, as sort of like the artist version of the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, in the sense that what we were doing was we were giving funding to artists to create ambitious works for major news organizations. And this is a sort of example of some of the pieces that we did. We worked with The Guardian, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Wired, Gizmodo, The Nation. These are some of the pieces we did. We helped support the Re-Educated, which was the most ambitious, immersive storytelling uh, project ever, ever published at The New Yorker that came out last year. We also worked with Allison, which we will get to um, when she speaks as well. Um, and then we also, one of, the, one of the most recent pieces we did was a VR 360 project on the Red Summers, which was uh, with The Guardian, with the artist Bayate Ross Smith, which really investigated the summer of racial terrorism in the United States against black Americans. And so this is a little snippet of my own work that I've done. And now what we're going to do is move on to Allison. Oh, sorry, very last thing I wanted to say very, is that the final thing that I did um, and I'm doing right now in an, in an effort to sort of groom more artists to work in this way is I'm teaching at the Rhode Island School of De Design along with Jake Charles Reese from the Center for Investigative Journalism, a course in which we're teaching artists how to sort of gear their, their, their projects that will then sort of be able to live within newspapers or magazines. Sorry, sir, yeah, sir, nice, sorry. Um, oh, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Surya Matu. I'm an investigative data journalist at, a, at The Markup, which is a nonprofit news organization based out of New York City. Um, so I've got a couple of slides that I want to go through, but essentially, like, I, I just want to kind of walk through my journey of how I got here to journalism because it was kind of like a winding path and Kind of to Marissa's point, I think there's many different ways in which people do this work, and I think I just have one example of what that looks like. So my, my background, my academic background is in engineering. I studied electronic engineering. And um, after doing a bunch of engineering stuff, I found my way into art school. I was always interested in um, creative technology, finding creative expression, using technology, and that was kind of my personal passion. And I found myself constantly gravitating towards projects that were around like revealing the invisible kind of hand of technology, you know, all these things. So because of my electronics background, I had a deep understanding of um, technical protocols and the thing, like, you know, so stuff like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and, you know, all these things we use every day. And personally, I was always really interested in the humans that made those protocols. Like what were the decisions they were making when they made those protocols because as technology proliferated over the last 20 or so years with the proliferation of the internet all over the world, those protocols, social implications suddenly had a lot more power. 
Um, so the first project I want to show is actually, it was when I was in grad school, um, I was exploring Wi-Fi. So I think you have my yeah. slide, yeah. So this is back in 2014. Um, I was in New York City and there were these companies that had just kind of popped up that were offering in-store targeted advertising like you could get on the web browser. So basically the premise of this, these companies were, hey, you know how you can, they were telling stores like The Gap and Whole Foods and other like, you know, supermarkets and um, like fashion stores. Do you want to target people who come into your shops as well and as specifically as you target them online? We have a new technology, a new product for you where you can basically track how people are moving through your stores so that they can get um, these kind of really specific granular targeting campaigns targeted to them. So if you want to know like how often someone's coming to your store, we have the product for you. So I saw this and I was like, this sounds weird and creepy and I don't know why, but something sounds funky about this. But because I have a background in engineering, I, was, I could dig deeper into how they were doing it, what the actual product was. And when I dug in, they basically were relying on Wi-Fi. So, I'm sure everyone here has had the experience of having their phone's Wi-Fi on and then not being connected to a network, right? And then like, when you go home, your phone automatically connects to the Wi-Fi network. So the way that actually works from at a protocol level is that your phone has a list, or it used to, it's changed now, but it used to have a list of Wi-Fi networks it had connected to. And when you weren't connected to a network, it was constantly going through that list of networks trying to find them. So your phone is kind of this like incredibly desperate device just trying to connect you to Wi-Fi because most people didn't want to use the data plans of their cellular networks because those were expensive. So the protocol was designed to, to make connecting to Wi-Fi a very easy thing to do and the way they did it was they just broadcast all this information into the ether because like what's in a Wi-Fi network name, right? It doesn't really matter and if you put the network name in the broadcast, it saves like two seconds in the connection process and makes it a little more seamless. So I started digging into this stuff, wrote some code to um, kind of see what this data looks like and what I noticed was that people hadn't taken into account how personal Wi-Fi network names are. So if you think about it, like every Wi-Fi network you've connected to, if your phone is broadcasting that all the time unencrypted, that actually tells a lot about you, right? It tells you the places you've been to, the conferences you visited, the hotels you stayed at. It was um, also like kind of serendipitous for me because I did this project while I was in grad school where I knew a lot of the people around me. So I could really, from the list of networks I was collecting, I could see um, I could see who they were. Like, it was quite clear to me that, oh, this is my friend Adam because, you know, he's been to Florida and he told me he went on this, to this conference or whatever. And I started writing code to, to kind of like dig into this and what I ended up with was these Wi-Fi portraits. So I actually made these portraits of people. So can we have the next slide, please? Um, yeah, so I started making these portraits of people which was just essentially a list of their Wi-Fi network names uh, and the MAC address, which is the unique identifier of their device. And this is the data that, you know, these companies were essentially relying on to target you in the stores. So this is how they were, so they were saying it's totally like, you know, anonymous, no private information. We're just getting like these Wi-Fi signals, totes cool, no problem. And then the reality is there's a lot of really specific information. So what I would, the experience I had doing this project was talking to people, telling them all this stuff about, you know, Wi-Fi works like this, there's these things called beacon frames, blah, blah, blah and I could see the like eyes glaze over, completely uninterested, and then I would say, oh, anyway, here's your portrait. Here's what I found about you. And they would see their network names and their reaction would always be, oh my God, how did you do that? And I would always have to say, I just told you. I literally like 30 seconds ago told you exactly how I did it. But that was a really important moment for me because I understood there's a huge difference between telling people how this stuff works kind of cerebrally and showing them what it looks like for their data. So like this person, like this portrait, there's a network name on there called Umpalai Umpato, and that network is actually belongs to her um, sister, sister's home network in Uruguay, and that's the first sound her nephew ever made. Her sister and her husband thought it would be funny to make that the Wi-Fi network name, and you know, I showed her this portrait of hers in New York, and she saw this and she's like, how do you know about Umpalai Umpato? And I'm like, oh, your phone is just broadcasting it out. Like literally everywhere you go, your phone is just telling the world, I've been to NYU, are you here? Umpala Ampato, are you here? And it just completely changed like the way in which uh, she thought about 
uh, her data and like what it what like, what it can be done with it and how personal it really can be. So you know, I've, this these are the kinds of this is the kind of how I fell into this work. I was kind of coming from like a technical background, but trying to find ways to talk to people about where the technology meets society and like what those intersections are. So the people who made these protocols, right, they weren't thinking about the privacy implications, they were solving an engineering problem. But because of the way these things have scaled and the way that, you know, culture just gets embedded into the technology as we start using it at a large scale, these issues come up. So there's this constant cat and mouse game and that's kind of where I, I spend a lot of time thinking. So I have one more project I want to show and then we can move on, are we good on time? No, I'm not working on Twitter. Yeah, so I'll do yeah. yeah. Okay. So the second project I want to talk about is Unfit Pits. This is a collaboration with an artist, Tiga Brain, and this is around 2015, again in New York. At the time, there was a, this huge chatter around, uh, around sm fitness trackers, and basically around then, insurance companies had started coming out with these programs where they would say, if you, take a, if you get a discount, you can get a discount on your health insurance premium if you let us track your data. So the idea was that insurance is expensive, we wanna help you make it safe, like cheaper. You know, if you track yourself, we'll give you an insurance discount. And it seems like a reasonable thing to do, right? It's like, I don't care if my health insurance company, some people felt that, I didn't feel that, but some people felt I don't care if my health insurance company is getting this data, I get a discount. But the, the real problem with it from our perspective was if you start tying health insurance to something a fitness tracker can measure, you've really reduced the scope of what a healthy person is, right? So if you think about fundamentally what a fitness tracker is, it is an accelerometer, which is a sensor that measures acceleration. So like it's not good at measuring this, but it is good at measuring this. And the reason it measures that is because acceleration is a good proxy for motion. So when you walk, we don't walk at kind of a linear pace, we walk with like kind of a gait, and that's what an accelerometer is measuring. Now if you think about that is what a fitness tracker can measure, and now that is being used as a way to measure health, think about all the people who get left out from the conversation of health, right? Who, who has to now prove to this simple sensor that, you know, Maybe I didn't walk 10,000 steps a day, but my doctor told me not to walk 10,000 steps a day. You know, like maybe my profile doesn't fit into the median of what, uh, what is like healthy. And all these people who kind of are on the edge cases or outliers or just even slightly off the, the median suddenly have to now prove to their insurance companies that, you know, they are healthy in fact. Can I get the next slide, please? I think I have one more. Um, so yeah, so, so, so this is kind of how we did it. We, uh, there's a video that you can go to, if you go to unfitbits.com, you can watch our video. We kind of made like a spoof startup where we, we told you how to free your fitness data from yourself and encouraged you to essentially spoof your fit, fitness data to get the insurance discounts without doing any of the exercise. And the idea was to just give people a sense of how dumb these trackers are and how easy they are to spoof. And the thing we really wanted to highlight was how if you start normalizing this, People, this is going to have like punitive measures where doing what we were saying to do was actually going to become risky. But like what we noticed is that people had this problem all the time. Someone left their fitness tracker in their washing machine and then they got 15,000 steps. Now in the future, if that's considered illegal or like mischief because from an insurance perspective because you lie to your insurance company, is that really the fault of the person who's using the tracker or of a system that is kind of taking the one, one side versus the rest? So these are the kinds of things I used to do, and then I'll have one more slide and then I can stop. Uh, so, and that's kind of culminated in the work I do now at The Markup, which is sort of this investigative data journalism, where um, I, like what I learned from the art projects and this kind of way of thinking is that in order to get people to meaningfully understand how technology affects them, uh, you need to give them a sense of agency around the role technology plays in their life, not apathy. And usually when we talk about technology, people just, there's a huge sense of apathy. It's unclear how these things work. They seem really complicated. But in reality, if you can just like get, get behind the protocol, right, and just kind of put that aside, there's human beings making this stuff. And they're making it with a set of assumptions and values embedded within it from their perspective. And what I try to do is just build tools that allow people to bring their values to, to the technology they use. So Bracklight is a, real-time website privacy inspector, and its goal is essentially that you can type in any website into it, 
and it'll give you a real-time report of all the different trackers that are on this website. So, you know, in the past, we, there are tools that exist that are in a similar ecosystem, like ad blockers, for example, allow you to block, you know, browser extensions. They allow you to block all the trackers on your site. There have been a lot of studies done in academia that shows you the implications of privacy and all the different trackers that, you know, websites, all the different ways websites can track you. But there's no easy way for someone who doesn't have a technical background to be able to ask questions of these devices of these websites and the people who make them. So the goal of Blacklight was to give people a real-time report that was fairly easy to understand but was technically specific so that they could go, like, you know, like imagine a parent whose kid's school has a website that has a bunch of trackers. The goal of Blacklight was to allow them to go to the school and say, hey, excuse me, can you tell me why your website is doing this? And someone would have to actually answer for that. So that's kind of my journey. I started from like the art stuff, but this is so all of that thinking kind of came from an artistic practice, but went into the journalism. And now I'll shut up. Thank you. Hi, I'm I'm Alison. I'm an architect by background, and for I, I'm licensed, and I worked for several years in commercial practice doing architecture and urban planning before starting to work for myself in, um, in about 2010. Um, this, this slide that we can see on the screen is from a project I did in 2015 to 2017. It's called Migration Trail, and it's the first project that I did that really moved in this more um, documentary and journalistic direction. And it's, it's a mapped data visualization that tells the story of two fictional migrants who are traveling to Europe in real time. And we used a lot of maps and data, and we worked with two writers who came from Nigeria and Lebanon to write the, the voices of these two characters, which would then be um, presented as a social media feed which you could get on your phone in Facebook Messenger. And the idea with this project was um, to, to bring more attention to, to an issue which was clearly important but didn't seem to be getting as much attention as it needed as it deserved, and also to try and tell the story in a new way because I was finding that, or well, I had heard that even when um, stories about migration were being told, that they actually got some of the lowest traffic on, on news sites, websites. Um, and so this was about trying to tell it in a way that would make it immediate and, and more intimate for an audience. I have the next slide. Um, this is um, a project which which came out of an arts workshop in 2018, 2019. And this was, the first, uh, this was the first work that I did with BuzzFeed News. And this, we, we discovered at this arts workshop, which was focused on surveillance, that we could look at these um, public CCTV cameras, which are just streaming in high resolution 4K, live on the web, anyone can access them. And that um, if we went and looked at the Instagram stories that were being shared in those public spaces, that we were often able to match the Instagram stories to the CCTV footage, identify the person who had taken the story, and from there we could kind of stalk them both all over the web because we could connect their Instagram accounts to, well, we could look right through their Instagram posts, we could connect to their other social accounts, but we could also start to track them right around the city because we had this fixed point in the CCTV that we could then like batten together from from other CCTV cameras. So an incredibly um, creepy um, discovery um, with, on a platform that most people think of as being like very friendly and benign. Yeah, next piece. Um, and this is the last project that I'll show you. This is a project I've spent the last two, three years on, um, which is a project to find the um, the, the network of detention camps in Xinjiang, um, which is in northwest China. It, it's estimated that there's over a million people detained there. And because there are so many restrictions on, on the internet and information in China, because there are so many restrictions on journalists' work in Xinjiang, for a long time after the rumors started to appear about um, like hundreds of thousands of people disappearing into these camps, that there, were, there wasn't a huge amount of evidence there. Uh, and I teamed up with a reporter from BuzzFeed News, Mega Rajagopalan, who has worked in China for many years, and who was very keen to find 
the rest of the camps. And we started to work together um, using satellite imagery, which meant that we could work effectively from outside of China um, to try and find the full network. And the way that we did that was to start tracking censorship, which we discovered in Baidu maps. Um, we discovered that at the locations of the camps, there was a light gray square that would appear at a specific zoom level, um, which we, we later learned was confirmed as censorship. Um, and by tracking those masked tiles, we were able to find the full camps network. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it for me. Yeah, and, and this is um, an annotated drawing of, of one of the camps. I'll leave that there. Okay, great. Rob. Um, okay. Hello. Um, Marissa, hi. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Robin. Uh, so um, my background's in journalism. I started off as a reporter uh, and then became an editor. And um, yeah, cool. So uh, six years ago, I made that uh, alongside a bunch of really talented colleagues at the Financial Times. Um, it's a news game where you play as a full-time Uber driver in San Francisco trying to make a living. And with that project, what I wanted to do was to try to use game design mechanics and uh, techniques to try to bring to life and make more impactful the sort of lived uh, everyday real life experience of the Uber drivers, which sometimes gets lost in the business reporting about Uber as a company or the sort of overall picture of looking at the company and what it is doing. Um, so the game ended up being really successful and really popular. More than half a million people have played it. And in making it, what it really started to make me think about and realize is that game design is really just sort of one mode or one way of designing a narrative experience for people to go through. And so I started thinking, besides game design, what else can we as journalists sort of learn from and draw from in order to create these sorts of narrative experiences? And so about a year later, if we go to the next slide, um, I started this Contemporary Narratives Lab uh, together. Uh, I got together with Andre Pisa, who's a journalist and theater director from Brazil, and later um, Professor Dr. Glenda Cooper from City University uh, joined us to just sort of make a space. All three of us were interested in this intersection uh, in this sort of area, and we just sort of made the space for us to explore. And um, our first project happened about a year later. We got a very tiny bit of funding, and we're able to, if we go to the next slide, um, do a project where we paired up five groups of artists with journalists at the Financial Times and their stories. Um, it was a really, really short pilot, so they only had five days from beginning to end, uh, and they were, the artists were told to use the journalism, to use the reporting material, to use the stories as a jumping off point to create new work, so not just to sort of you know, re-present what was already in the story, but you, to use that as an inspiration and as a jumping off point. Um, it was really great. We were able to, at the end of five days, gather everybody back together and do a uh, in-person, real-life sort of show uh, uh, at the Battersea Art Center in London uh, to present the sort of scratch performances, the MVP performances from these artists. Um, this was really encouraging, partly because, as you can sort of see a little bit of a glimpse of it from these photos, of just the wide range of pieces and performances that came out of uh, the journalism. Uh, but it also kind of highlighted the shortcomings of what a, this really short engagement, you know, like how much can you really do in five days? Um, so for our second project, um, which took place last year, uh, we um, got a little bit more funding and this time there was only one pair. So we paired up one group of artists with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Um, so Kony, our interactive theater makers, um, and the Bureau, huge thank you to them if any of them are around or will see this, um, to the Bureau uh, and specifically the Bureau local team and the health inequality team which was investigating this story during the pandemic. Um, and because we were able to pair up the artist and the journalist together for 10 weeks, um, it actually ended up being a bit more because the pandemic sort of messed the timings of everything up. Um, the artists, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, were able to create sort of intermediate pieces of work during that time uh, and respond to what the Bureau was doing journalistically. So um, this is not a great picture of it, but basically Kony created a sort of guided interactive discussion uh, to take place, a sort of after party to take place after one of the Bureau's open newsroom events on that investigation. And the discussion from that after party became inputs actually to the final piece that was produced at the end uh, of that 10 week process. Um, next. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into the full details of what that project was because there's not a lot of time, but I just kind of want to highlight, so this is a quote from uh, someone from the Bureau side, um, which was sort of this uh, way and this ability to represent people's lived experiences and some of the materi reporting material uh, both back to themselves and to others uh, was valuable 
and impactful, and I think it sort of highlights increasingly the area that I'm interested in exploring and we're trying to facilitate with the Contemporary Narratives Lab, which is that it's not really just about an artist-journalist collaboration. Um, it's, really, it's not really just about how an artist or a journalist works together. It's really about how a journalist, an artist, and members of the public can come together to co-create and how we as journalists can work with artists and people of other disciplines to sort of create and hold open a space for civic discussion that is fact-based so that we can sort of create or facilitate healing, change, and impact. Um, and so uh, the last thing that I'll show uh, which uh, it makes me very joyful because I have zero involvement in this other than as an admirer of it, um, is, is sort of shows that it's not just us interested in this, that this sort of thing is happening um, it, with other places with other people as well. Uh, so this happened in Toronto. Uh, this is from Talk Media and Adam Chen, um, who uh, for this festival last November uh, used an online platform called Gather and they worked with a bunch of residents and uh, groups of different people in Toronto to create, if we go to the next slide, um, and interactive, multimedia, massively multiplayer, um, online exhibition space, basically, that was open for a week and everybody sort of got to create their little avatar and go in and interact with others and experience the work and experience the journalism. Um, and this is really exciting to me because um, this shows that some of this work can be done entirely online, can be done entirely digitally, and that technology is actually sort of creating new ways for us to do these sort of collaborations or to open up these sorts of spaces. Um, yeah, that's me. Okay. Hi. Hi, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little, bit of, a little bit about some of the ideas surrounding and definitions of the, that kind of make working with art at the intersection of art and journalism challenging. And um, it, does, it always makes sense to start with some definitions. So I'm going to choose a definition for art that of course, there are many, but I'm going to choose one, which is art is something that unsettles thought. It unsettles our perception of space, or in Ai Weiwei's memorable phrasing, it's a nail in the eye. It's, a, it's something that changes the way we see, changes the way we perceive the world around us. And this function of art has... Um, of course, there's many other definitions. There's didacticism, there's all sorts of ways that art can be in the world. We've heard some of them this morning. But this way of being, this kind of motion or, 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 a, or direction, doesn't necessarily sit very well with uh, the basic um, goals of journalism. The basic definition of journalism is to inform, to explain, to investigate, and to set narrative frames for thinking about how the world works. And so the explanatory function versus the kind of shock function um, are two epistemic systems that don't necessarily merge very well. And they don't, and it can, sometimes they do, and, but oftentimes the, they kind of sit in a, what do we call, something like a knowledge hybrid. Like, like because e each of them are systems for creating knowledge. So I thought what I would do as I was thinking about what to say was to say, how are some different, what are some different approaches for like building these kinds of knowledge hybrids so that one can try to merge different ways of thinking. And I'm going to show a few different works that I've done over the years, basically as ways to illustrate some of these ideas. So the first one is a deranged or destabilizing of the norms of journalism. Oh, I should also say, by the way, that every piece of work that I'm showing here has some truth or reality-based element, even if it is not um, ultimately uh, the object in, in, its, in its current form, but all of it partook of or was part of a journalism experience at some point in its path. So the idea of a, of a deranged or destabilizing norm is that the way we practice journalism has like very strict rules. So for example, if you have an image that you share, you have to caption it. You have to explain where it comes from. You have to explain who took it. You have to explain its copyright. Um, and that creates um, a placing of the image as a sec in a secondary or, or illustrative role to the text surrounding it. Um, the work that I just showed up here, this is from a, an eight-year project that I did in Central Asia and Siberia called White Road. And this is an exhibit that was in the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. in 2012 and 2013. Um, I just, I'm just showing this image to try to illustrate a, um, a, a way of 
exploding a narrative outside of um, a typical architecture of a, of a seven or eight image story um, that is standard for, a photo, for the photojournalism world in which images are captioned and images are subordinate to text. And in this case, the work ended up being a two volume book in which text and, vo and images were separate volumes. So you had to reimagine and place them together in your head rather than having the relation explained for you. Um, the next, pro next, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, this is a, a similar project. This is a project called KCR, Karachi Circular Railway. Um, and it's, a, it's an exploration I did about uh, urban, urban landscape in Karachi in 2014, 2015. And this, is a, this slide is uh, an example, is a public art installation in, in the heart of Karachi showing the work. It's a similar kind of challenge. Instead of just photographing the space, I photographed it in a systematic way. And then instead of captioning the work, I created a class or a structure for, for uh, de descriptions of the landscape in, in, this, in the space of the city. And then paired the captions that I wrote with classes of images and built a randomizing engine so that random captions affiliated with random images on the basis of class image class, so that you could, um, you, watched, you watched or experienced the whole piece over 15 hours. Um, but the divorce or the restructuring of journalistic norms is what created the work, what created the art. And it ended up, um, next slide please, this is a, just a single slide from that, that set of images of about 10,000 images in the original, in the whole set, and a, a large body of text that, com that continuously reaffiliated with one another. The third version, the third, uh, um, the next approach that I want to talk about is called speculative futures. So that first one is deranged or destabilized norms. The next one is speculative futures. Speculative, hmm? right. next slide please, yeah, thank you. So when we take a picture and show something about the world, we're, tr we're trying to describe it as it is. And, uh, but another way of imagining the world is what it might be and to look for conceptual or symbolic meaning in images and try to highlight them in that context. This is a picture from Mariupol in 2016, which has currently been destroyed, as probably many of you know. Uh, I went there in order to imagine what it was like to uh, live in a city that is at peace, but right next to a war zone. And I photographed it with uh, the intent of finding sort of attending to visual cues that were symbolic of the potential alternative future of being back in war. So these large objects that are painted with flowers are called tetrapods, and they are used um, in ports to hold back the sea. And they, are, they became symbols in the war um, of Ukrainian resistance. And here they're painted with Ukrainian flowers, folk flowers. And uh, of course, they didn't actually hold back the war, as we know, but they were symbolic thereof. And next slide, please. Um, we've seen in the, over the past month many, many images of people fleeing from Ukraine, and it's a typical photo, photojournalistic trope, documentary trope of migrants departing from conflict zones that looks exactly like people moving throughout their daily lives on buses, in cars, in transport. So uh, this is an image. I took many, many pictures of people traveling on buses and in commuter spaces. And this is one of those pictures um, that is very similar to what we've been looking at over the last month, but slightly and uncannily different. You'll notice the rows. Um, this, this project was published with Creative Time. Uh, with Creative Time Reports. And interestingly, I tried to publish it with Foreign Policy, and they said, well, it's too conceptual for us. So um, in, every, in every one of the ca these cases, like some, work of, some of this work was published as journalism, but then represented or recreated in an arts context. Next slide, please. Um, I've got one more model that I'm gonna show. It's called Reconfigured Collections. So a collection is a body of work, like an archive. And uh, what I, one, of, one practice that I tend to do is work with either established collections or I make my own 
and then I alter it in very particular ways. So the first conflict zone that I covered was the first Chechen war in 1996. And I went there to photograph um, the horrorscape of, of Grozny at the end of that conflict. And I published that work as a relatively straightforward landscape journalism piece. But at the same time, I started making photo montages and photo collages out of that work. And um, in Russian Soviet history, there's a very famous war photographer, a man named Yevgeny Khalde, who uh, some of you may know this image. He was a, a photographer in World War II, and he photographed uh, and actually staged the very famous image of Soviet soldiers on top of the German Reichstag after the Soviets entered Berlin. And there's all these men standing and holding Soviet flags. And he staged that picture, it's fake. And I had the opportunity to meet him in Moscow in 1996, and I took his portrait. So what I started doing was I cut his eye out of that picture, and I made a series called Yevgeny's Eye. And I've been placing his eye into reconfigured works as part of a montage. So this particular image is um, from a uh, destroyed Soviet mur mur mural in Chechnya, in Grozny. And the eye in the center is Yevgeny's. So one more, uh, one more project quickly to show. Um, I worked with archives in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years, still am when I find the time, um, based on the, the collections that I'm working with there are called the Captured Collections. They're a body of newsreels, documentary, and propaganda films from World War II. They come from Germany, Italy, and Japan. And what I've been doing is systematically re-photographing them and then building new, uh, new films and new storyboards out of the basis of that material using the narrative voiceovers from those films as uh, capturing snippets of text from those voiceovers to name the pieces. Um, and I'm just gonna show you two slides from one of them. This is a, a film, a short film I made called These Are Clear Proofs and I'm projecting it on the side of the Newseum, which is a museum about, uh, for the news industry in Washington, D.C. Uh, next slide, please. And um, it's projected actually on the First Amendment. And this particular film is about uh, an incident that was, was filmed by a German newsreel company that of an American, an American military um, exercise in 1934. And that was about them pretending to suppress a communist demonstration and using tear gas and machine guns. So it's like a, a piece of Nazi propaganda made in collaboration with the American military in the 1930s. And I, and I placed it on the First Amendment. This was during the time of the Trump uh, attempted takeovers of um, basically of America. So this is a, a way that I'm kind of combining or using the language of news but then remaking and reconfiguring those collections. So I'll stop there. Okay, that was, that was really excellent. I actually want to talk a little bit about what you just said and um, ask Robin a question about this because you use the language of an editor who said to you at, the, at Foreign Policy that this was too conceptual for us. Now I have to also say that very often when I was working in this way, I would approach and create these partnerships with publications. And one time, um, I won't say the publication, but I was accidentally CC'd on an email in which my project, um, well, it was called Hippy Dippy, and, um, <laughs> and it was sort of like seen as a sweet idea, um, well, artists weighing in on the news. Um, but it was also things like too conceptual were often thrown at us. And I feel like um, I feel like over the years, a lot of these projects that we've been talking about have proven themselves to be far beyond, you know, sweet and sort of, you know, uh, relegated to the back pages of a newspaper, but actually have shown um, how serious and thought-provoking and um, 
you know, important they are, yet you still find that a lot of editors are either A, struggling to shore, show their higher ups that this work is worthy and deserves the time and resources at a publication, um, or, you know, you know, you're just seen as it being like not really serious. So Robin, you're actually in the position at a publication, in an editorial position. What are some of the struggles you feel are, you know, you have when trying to advocate for this kind of work at a publication? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Marissa. Um, yeah, I totally hear what you're saying and feel your pain because um, some of the work that I was doing at the FT uh, was possible in part because my job title then was special projects editor. And so the idea is that even in an institution, like you have to have, it, it's considered different, it's considered special, it's considered not part of what we do. Um, but the FT was a big enough organization and generous enough and experimental enough to create a separate space for us to try to do some of this thing. Um, and so I think some of the struggles is that uh, broadly sort of institutional and cultural change is long and hard and that editors approach um, commissioning and green lighting and going ahead with stories uh, with a set of expectations both in their own heads of how they were trained up and grew up and, and learned the craft of journalism but also what they believe reflects sort of what is expected from the audience who will approach this work expecting it to be a piece of journalism of, in the format that they're used to, right? Um, and so in one way, um, the Uber game ended up being successful because it was surprising and it was able to challenge those assumptions. Uh, people was like, I can't believe it was the FT that made this. We thought it would be another organization or it would be something different. But that also just highlights how, well, you can't do that every time because you can only sort of use that as a surprise because it was the first time. Um, I will say though, that on a positive note, that um, this, there is change and this change is happening, but it, on a gradual and slower basis because, uh, so my now former employers at the FT has recently built and bulked up a visual storytelling team. Um, the journal itself is increasing. Uh, Shazan is here today, our visual editor. Um, it, her, she has a growing team. She has increasingly guiding more uh, collaborations. I think sort of success in this case actually ends up looking like unremarkable pieces, sort of these sort of things happening as a matter of course, as, as, as a matter of sort of the organizations being um, organized and structured in a way to enable day-to-day -day examples of these happening and they're not necessarily considered, you know, something to necessarily highlight and talk about at, at, a, at a festival, for example. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit about your background as an artist and how, if you could just talk a little bit about that being infused in the way that you work. You sort of touched upon it a little bit, but um, I like, you've once said, um, I think the quote is, a photojournalist in algorithm city. I'd love to hear a little bit about your practice and how you connect it to your work at the markup or all of the publications that you've been working with. I'm sure, so I'll say that um, the biggest thing for me uh, in like looking back, it, it like it all makes sense. It's a nice narrative, but the thing about uh, the con framing a lot of what I do as art is it just gave me a lot of permission to do what I wanted and go with my instinct rather than try to think about the structure. I mean, I was thinking about what Ivan was saying, and I think it's true that like with journalism, it really has to fit into the box. And when I started working as a journalist, a lot of what I was interested in did not fit into those boxes. So figuring out how to take where I thought the actual story was and get it to a place where you can, um, where it has the journalistic value that, you know, kind of fits into what you expect in like the unremarkable way that like Robin was talking about has been a big part of my kind of journey. And what I've learned from all the different projects I've done is that, you know, like anything else, there's many types of art and there's many types of data journalism. And I find myself always in this place where the thing that I always come back to is where do the humans meet the technology and how do I capture that moment? So that's just like where I landed uh, because of kind of my interests and like my intuition and you know, my aesthetics. Um, and doing it as art basically means that I don't need to think as much, especially because a lot of the work I do is focused on technology and the, the technology doesn't fit the platform of traditional journalism. 
So thinking about it as art, thinking about how to be expressive about these concepts and ideas in a way that still speaks to accountability, speaks to harm, but, but there can also be a sense of like delight or pleasure for the person experiencing the work. Um, it's easier for me to kind of think of that as art and do that as art and then take pieces of that and put it into the journalism. Allison, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your role. You, when we've spoken earlier, you talked about, well, people have an idea of what a freelance writer is, a freelance photographer is, but when I came to the table, people were struggling to understand like, what my role is. Now, you have also said that it's gotten easier, but yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that process and what you see as the necessary next steps might be in order to sort of gain more acceptance in terms of that editorial landscape. Sure. So when I did, when I did the Instagram project, um, we, I'd, I'd worked together with a, with a colleague sort of and done that initial research and we were like, you know, this is actually like a really interesting news story to pitch to publications. And I tried to make a, a whole series of pitches and what I was continuously getting back was that people were saying like, okay, like you go away and like do your project, do your research, and then, you know, send us the report, send us the press release, and then we'll think about publishing it. Um, they didn't really, know, and they were saying like, you know, it, it sounds cool, but this isn't something that we would get involved in ourselves. Um, and it was just like they didn't seem to know what to do with someone who wasn't a writer or who wasn't a photographer, like the standard sorts of people who they work with. The, the problem with what they were suggesting was that it left me to do all of this work of basically like researching and reporting out this story, doing it for free and then handing it over to them to publish. And, and those people were getting paid. So there was a real like financial problem in there. Um, the way that it finally got published the way that it finally got published, um, I was already starting to work with BuzzFeed, and so already had those relationships um, with them, and, and we ended up working together on this as well. Um, but when I came to work with BuzzFeed on the Xinjiang story, Mega and I had actually met at a workshop um, in the summer of 2018, and like this workshop was like 10 days long. We'd had a lot of time to for the whole like group of us there to like to get to, to to know each other, to get to know each other's work, to hang out, um, and to also to discuss ideas. And Mega had she had been the first journalist to visit one of the camps in Xinjiang, and shortly after that, her visa didn't get renewed and she had to leave. But she was still keen to work on it, and she'd been thinking about satellite imagery, but didn't have a huge amount of experience. And I had that experience, and so we got talking about like, well, you know, the maybe we can work together. So the relationship was there and there was clear skills that they had a need for. The next thing that happened though was that I actually started grant writing for the project. Uh, we got this, we got my time and Christo's time. Christo was the developer who worked with us on this. And the two of us, our time was paid by the Open Tech Fund and I actually did all of the fundraising about that. So it was also quite, it was relatively easy to, for BuzzFeed to say yes to this, um, in, at least in financial terms. Um, in terms of like Mega going and pitching the project, she said that she like she went into this pitch meeting and she thought that when she went in and said like, "Hey guys, I want to find all of the camps in Xinjiang. I'm going to work with an architect and developer to do it," she thought that like they were just going to think she was insane. Um, and, and they didn't, they, they actually went for it. And she said that one of the things that really worked in her favor was that it was, BuzzFeed is a very new uh, news organization. And so there was no one there to go like, well, you know what guys, we've been doing this for a hundred years and we've never done this before. There was no one to say that. And so it was an organization which was um, much more, much newer, had fewer traditions and fewer like processes there. And so they were much more open and willing to be experimental. Ivan, I want to talk about the Karachi project a little bit. And, you know, this was an, a huge project that you spent so much time on, and yet you got funding from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting, right? So incredible. Um, and yet when you started to work and seek publications, you, you hit a wall. 
what is that wall, and this is probably gonna be the last question that we have because we're about to run out of time, but what is that wall and how can we overcome that now? So there are many walls there and I built them all. <laughs> so I did publish parts of that work with The Guardian and Foreign Policy, but the, the work that I published with those, with those organizations were descriptive descriptive of the challenge, like articles, so descriptive of the challenge that Karachi is facing as a city. And when I tried to show the work itself, there was no space. There was not even a mechanism for understanding it at those types of publications. The work itself is an intentionally anti-dramatic. It's intentionally um, seeks to show the experience of what it feels like to move through a congested city um, in, a com in, a, in a commuter space. So it's quite dreamy and in, it intentionally separates text from um, text from images in ways that confuse and confound, and that's not what journalism tends to do. So I, I ended up um, I, I had two museum shows for that work, and I put it in ten different film festivals. But I still didn't get that wasn't enough for the Pulitzer Center <laughs> because they wanted it to be published in a magazine, and eventually it was. Eventually it was published in a in a journal of landscape architecture. And, uh, and that satisfied their formal requirements of the grant. But, but the what would you hope that more editors would bring to the discussions with you? What are the things that you feel are missing from these conversations? Last question. So I, I just think that there needs to be a, a, a way of framing. So, so much of what journalism is, is designing and creating frames for understanding the world. And Oftentimes, those frames are actually quite conservative. They're quite reactionary. So media outlets, especially the bigger broadcast media, they'll do two or three stories a day, and they determine the priorities of their, of their storytelling in advance. And if you don't fit within that narrative frame, then it's not going to get published, or it's, not gonna, it's going to be reinterpreted within that frame. So work that is seeking to destabilize our understanding in my original formulation a media outlet needs to have, create a space in which there's almost like a portal to that understanding. Like, like with Robin's work, it created a portal for that, or BuzzFeed creating a portal for Allison's work. And um, because we're talking about different epistemic systems, different systems of knowledge, and I think just a last point, which is the work of the forensic imaginary, which is what Allison, Allison does in other groups like uh, forensic architecture, is maybe the most challenged in this space because it actually has three different epistemic systems, three different knowledge systems, legal, arts, and, and journalism. And those things fit together very uncomfortably sometimes. It, um, and we hope to see you. If you have any additional questions, we'll be around <laughs> for the next few days. Um, thank you to the panelists, that was wonderful, and um, we'll see you all soon. Thank you.